Welcome, Professor. Um, you said it yourself. No, we're probably sick of writing, and what I heard from that is that you're probably sick of reading. Um, so I present to you my first special, um, which is called Cozy's Portfolio. Um, and I'm going to go over here in this video of timeline, kind of, of what this course prompted me to think about. Um, yeah, so here are some of my brightest moments. <laughs> Thank you. Hope you enjoy. So I wanted to start off with a quick disclaimer, which is that I did have a lot of trouble during this course, but I struggled with accepting kind of the general use of kind of categorization in psychology. Um, and in this class, there's lots of categorization by like attachment type or parenting style. Um, and it groups individuals and like predicts the way they're going to act, um, which just feels really inherently wrong, especially in a course where you know, it depends was the most popular um, bumper sticker. So it was just this really confusing mix of like, how are we going to teach people psychology? I was understanding that I'm in a course and you have to, you have to generalize some things, you know, based off of studies. That's, that's how you can relay information. That's how you can tell people how to act. Um, but it just seemed really, really off-putting that in a class where we're kind of saying that everybody's different, we're also being like, well, this person has secure attachment, so that means they act this way, um, and they will act the same way as all of their other peers in that same category. So that's my blurb, that's my disclaimer, but let's get into it. So the first question I'm going to set out to answer is how and why do children develop the way that they do? Answering this question before I took this class, based on kind of the holistic education views of my parents, I would have thought, childhood development, very complex. How correct and naive I was. Since this course, I've learned a lot more about development. And I wanted to start off with the fact that everybody is biologically cultural. And I think that's a huge aspect of how and why people develop. So biologically cultural um, kind of explains the biology of you, the DNA, in the culture of you, the what you do, like what you eat, who you're with, how you're educated, your expectations, look at your class, your values. And then that goes into epigenetics, um, which is kind of the culmination of both of those things affecting your life. So that's, we read about that in an article by Sokolsky and Baus. Um, but it says that epigenetics are the ways that your behaviors, such as diet and exercise routines, or environment can change the expression of your genes. Um, so kind of an example of this that I really held on to was that um, healthy eating can hide cancer-related genes, um, and it changed the expression um, and kind of can be a preventative measure. That heads into the cultural context of places with food apartheid, um, which is what we're now calling food deserts, um, who only have access within their neighborhood without transportation to um, maybe a dollar, a dollar store for their food. And if that's the only means that you can get, then you have a higher likely for your gene expression to be more prone to cancer. Um, and further down the line, um, you're predisposed to this terrible disease. So that's a wonderful example of how culture and biology um, kind of influence development together. So kind of from this, we know that there's, there's nothing off limits um, of what can influence a child's development. Um, so it's, pretty, it's, a, it's a very jarring field to understand. Um, but given that, here are some categories of things that are known to influence development and that we can focus around for our little lecture. So the first of my three major developmental factors is going to be parenting style. So I've written down this graph. Um, and the two axle axes are support and warmth, this being low support and warmth, this being high support and warmth and this being expectations, high and low. Um, so there's four different styles that we learned about from Roblox, shout out Roblox. Um, and at the highest of warmth and support and high expectation, you have an authoritative parent. Um, that's someone who talks through things with their kids, makes sure that they know why they're getting punished, if they're getting punished. Um, expectations are clear, lots of communication is there. Um, on the other side of high expectations, but low support and warmth, we have authoritarian, um, which is often someone who kind of seems militaristic with their parenting style, often would be described as really strict. Um, and then high support and warmth, but low expectations is permissive, 
Um, I think of those as like those hippie parents sitting in their chair, like kind of like just hanging out with their kids. Um, low expectations in terms of um, punishments, often none, none are there. And then on the, on the other side, you have low expectations and low support, and that is a neglective parent. Um, they don't listen to their kids, they don't tell their kids. So the second part of childhood development that I wanted to go over that I think is a major aspect of the influences um, is attachment style. And we learned about this in the context of Ainsworth's strange situation, um, which I won't go into too much detail about because you already know what it is, but essentially it's a, a mother and her child are in a room um, and then they go through a series of like entrances and exits um, and they observe this and they were able to figure out what kind of attachment style these children had and to kind of my previous point, like they were amused women, um, you know, they're, they're categorizing all of these babies into these like one groups and there's even a group called disorganized which means like I don't even know. So like is research real? Hard to say. So, but we'll go over these categories now which is secure attachment. That's a baby that uses the mom as a home base feels really secure with her there, can go away, go play, and then comes back, touches the mom, goes back away and plays. Um, an insecure attachment is kind of one of two things. It's either a baby that just like will cry no matter when the mom is there or not, um, or a baby that will like cry when being taken away from the mom, has a hard time like getting back into it, is really kind of scared of strangers. Disorganized, um, kind of like I was making fun of before, it just means it's not really predictable. It's just a baby that they can't categorize, so they make up another category of non-categorization. Um, and then there's two forms of anxious attachment, which is resistant and avoidant, um, kind of self-explanatory there. Um, they, would, they would approach new people very anxiously with the mom there. Um, sometimes they're very resistant, or sometimes they would just avoid it altogether. The final aspect, that I think is really important to childhood development is this word identity. Um, and identity is it's kind of the more complex areas. Um, it takes a lot of self-awareness. Um, so it comes a little later in life. With yourself in the middle, what you're trying to find, you have identity as one sector. And you defined that in a PowerPoint as it's a mature self-definition, a sense of who one is, where one is going, and how one can get there. Beyond that, self-esteem is one's evaluation of one's worth as a person based on assessment of qualities that make up their self-concept. That leads us over to self-concept, which is one's perception of one's unique characteristics and attributes. So what's funny is that all of those things mean the same thing. Um, but this isn't all personal identity. Um, this aspect called the looking glass self, which is Imagine people holding mirrors up to you, and that's how you see yourself. You perceive yourself based on others' feedback given to you, um, which isn't necessarily a true definition of self. Um, so I think a child's development kind of culminates when they finally have this, this concept of themselves. So to kind of finish off this section, I wanted to show you how all three of these things connect. Um, so kind of under the umbrella of biological cultural, we have our parenting styles, our attachment styles, and identity. Um, and can you imagine this child? Um, say this child's name is Ben. So Ben is biologically cultural. Everything that he does influences him. His parents are authoritative. His attachment style is secure. And his identity, you know, he's decided that he's liberal, he's atheist, and he believes in kindness above all else. Um, so it's really easy to see when you break down people's, people's lives into aspects like this, how Ben would be so different than Finn. Because <laughs> um, Finn grew up with everything that was different. So we come back to the question, why do children develop the way that they do? I will give you no more satisfying of an answer than I got in this course, but in conclusion, it depends. <laughs>
where I will explain some of the course objectives that I met um, with examples of these proofs of, of education, of learning um, that I've created throughout the course. My first example comes from a Rogoff reading. Um, it's a conversation we had in the comments section. Um, and I said, when thinking about ideal parenting styles, one is often to believe that authoritative is the best. Who wouldn't want to have high expectations and high love for a child? But the scale is an inaccurate representation of a parent's goals when they enact their style. Um, race has a huge influence on how one must parent their child, especially in America. This was responded to. They said, yes. As a black person, I would argue that some parents may think the authoritarian style is needed because if the child isn't dis disciplined, then the harsh conditions, such as race, racism, discrimination, etc., of the world will do it for them. This reminds me of the many conversations black families have with their children regarding how to act around a police officer. I really like this example of learning because um, it kind of shows my critical understanding of the topic, um, me applying it, and then further learning more through my peers and their experiences. Um, and it fits in really well with objective two. Um, kind of trying to expand my outlook on these topics that we're learning, um, thinking of it through different contexts um, to see kind of how these things that affect us could affect other people differently because of the host historical context in America that we live in. Um, the second example that I wanted to bring up is Myself's on the Shelves children's book. I wrote a book called Mom's Special Day. Um, it's about the ways that expedition behavior, which is a backpacking term, um, influences the ways that the people who embrace it um, apply it to their parenting, um, apply it to raising their kids. Um, this topic is very personal for me. Um, I definitely feel like I was one of the main subjects in my research. As a researcher, I really had to step away from the experiences that I knew were my own and think really critically about them. Um, think about this, this ideal day in my family um, and what we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, so I included things in the book like how it was my mom's special day, um, but she still had to wash the dishes because she's part of this team Interviewing my parents, I was more aware of the vocabulary that they were using, um, which is a hard thing to do because it's, it's hard to detach from, from this culture that you're within. Um, you know, you think about the analogy that a fish doesn't know what water is because it's never been outside of water. Um, so I had to kind of apply that analogy to my research, um, which is really in tune with objective three. Objective one expects us to recognize, understand, and respect the complexity of development across cultural communities and the diverse meanings of development. As I said about my previous post-course self, um, I've always understood that development is complex. Um, in my first learning log, I made a connection to my 12th grade um, philosophy course um, that I thought was really nice and exemplifies the complexities of development. So my response was in connection to the dandelion and orchid kid um, study. And I'm talking about my 12th grade philosophy class um, on a debate on whether or not to do drugs that we were having with our teacher. Um, so he brought up the basic metaphor that life is a cup. Um, he said that in your da daily life, you go about filling and spilling water in your life cup. The water level represents how contempt you are. Um, and he said that when you do drugs, it's likely that your brain will release like this unprecedented amount of dopamine and your cup will like overflow. You'll get more water than you've ever had before and it'll overflow. Um, but your body adjusts to this. And it makes your cup bigger so that next time it won't overflow. Um, so we ask him like, oh, is that, is that a good or a bad thing? And the answer is both. Um, your cup now has a higher potential for happiness, um, but it also takes, takes more dopamine to feel that same level of contempt that you felt before with a smaller amount of water in a smaller cup. So, kind of there, there's this pendulum that swings, similar to the dandelion and orchid kids. Um, and the higher you pull it up to the left, the farther it can go to the right. This reminded me of the dandelion and the orchid kids, because because orchids can be, have the highest of highs, um, but they can also be really hurt depending on their environment. Um, whereas the dandelion kids, you know, 
they'll never experience those, those polar extremes. I realize that this example kind of steps outside of the boundaries of just um, analyzing childhood development, but I think um, it exemplifies that I have this understanding that, um, you know, education or development both are um, cumulative and have so many intersections. Um, so it's important to be able to apply that type of critical thinking um, and connection building um, to courses you take in school or to understanding how a child develops. And I think that's really in tune with what objective one is looking for. When thinking about objective four, um, I would really like to kind of shout out my pod, pod number two. Um, I was probably the most diverse group of learners um, that I've experienced here at Smith. Um, we had someone who was very openly Christian, um, people of um, multiple races, multiple ethnicities, um, different ages, um, kind of different learning styles, different neurodiversities. Um, and it's interesting to talk about all of these topics with that group of people when kind of all of our identities aren't always the same, um, which is very often at Smith. Um, you find yourself being in a very liberal pocket. Um, and with that group, it, it was not that way. Um, and so kind of learning about these topics with this like underlying kind of unintended by you learning, um, just because I was in such a diverse group, um, I was kind of able to see the different ways um, the people in my group were parented or the attachment styles of the people in my group um, and just their opinions were so unexpectedly different than mine um, that it opened my eyes to, you know, if, if in the future I want to be a teacher, how, how will I approach that knowing that I'm not going to share every opinion with all of my students. Um, so pod two, you helped me understand objective number four. And to make one last joke about how it all matters, how, how everything affects everything, um, objective five is proven by everything that I did. Um, anything that I ever said in class, anything that I said in my pods, you know, all of my close reading, all of my skim reading, learning logs, um, mastery assessments, um, you know, conversations I had outside of this class about this class. Um, all of these prove that, you know, we're thinking critically, we're learning, we're reading, we're writing, we're analyzing. Um, Smith cultivates this culture of, of education as every part of your curriculum. We're coming up to the final part of this portfolio um, where I kind of outline my takeaways from this class. Um, so what did I learn? I think one of the main thing I learned is, is how can I make this this knowledge that I've learned in this class accessible. Um, I really like that second column in the learning logs where we had to define um, in, in terms that somebody outside of the class could understand the, the concepts that they, we were learning. Um, and I think I did that really well. I also learned and was able to practice this critical perspective about um, all parts of, um, all aspects of education that can lead to childhood development. Um, you know, kind of the rules that we implement in public schools and how they could impact a child, or um, kind of what the effects of sending your kid to private school has in terms of the lack of diversity that a lot of them um, have. In terms of broader learning experiences, um, I learned kind of throughout this semester that I just need to make, make work into what I want to do. Um, I can't focus on these mundane, repetitive, um, assignments if, if they're not fun for me. Um, so making things like a video or, um, you know, in the, in the learning log selecting interactive ones, in the mastery modules um, selecting letters to myself or um, co interviews, conversations, um, and being able to guide the coursework that I do around what interests me. Um, something that I've struggled with all my life is ADHD. Um, Reading in particular is really difficult for me. It's just not engaging. Annotating is really just like the worst list on the things that I hate. Um, so the perusal readings, um, pursual, um, were just really difficult for me. Um, I often would read them, um, try to go back over, and 
annotate what I could. It's just not how I learn. It felt really restrictive, the ICARS method particularly. Um, so I got really bad grades on that. Um, and it was it impacted me because that's like a very big part. It's a big percentage of our, of our final grade. Um, whereas things like the learning logs that I spend a lot of time on, I was really intentional about um, that I consider to be more interactive, more, you know, accessible for me. Um, those don't weigh nearly as much. Um, so I guess that kind of exemplifies the highs and lows of just like not being able to adapt myself completely to um, kind of the standards of the course by percentage of what things weigh. Um, I don't think that this course has had a particularly large impact on just the way I go about day-to-day -day life, um, but I will definitely take what I've learned in this course going forward, you know, as a prospective educator or um, even if I don't go into that field, just being able to better understand um, kind of the viewpoints that my parents look at me through. Um, it's interesting to have these like, you know, academic conversations with my parents that I've never had with them before um, because they do read Rogoff and um, so we're able to compare kind of our theories of what, what we know about it. Um, so I think coming away from this class, I've, you know, created this closer connection to my parents, um, created a closer connection with like the academics that I really value um, in life. Just teachers in, in general are so inspirational. Um, so whether or not I become a teacher, um, you know, you're always working with people. Um, so just understanding development in general is going to help you no matter what field you go into. I think unfortunately just because of the way that my brain works, I was never able to memorize the developmental stages. Um, and that's, that's a concept that I would wish to grasp more in terms of the specific ages, the specific like names of the categories. Um, I think I understand general, you know, as a child gets older, they like become less egocentrical and they are able to understand things on multiple planes. Um, but the term, the terminology and the timeline never connected in my brain. Um, so I think there's still more for me to learn there. Um, I think I'm really proud of how resilient I was during this semester. Um, I came into the school year, you know, I'm a first year. Um, and I really did not want to go to college, <laughs> especially not one um, kind of with, with as much emphasis on academics um, as Smith has. So I've had a lot of trouble just finding my place here. Um, and I'm actually transferring schools next semester and going through that whole process of trying to figure out what I really wanted, you know, advocating for myself um, to so many different adults, including my parents, which is really scary. Um, it's really hard and it took a lot of mental um, capacity. Um, so I'm impressed with myself for being able to kind of live that dual life of of trying to be here, understanding that I don't want to be here, and also just completing my courses in general. Um, so I, I would wish to say that I was resilient, um, and, I, and I hope it seems, it seems that way from an outsider's perspective. Um, thank you for watching this whole, whole spiel. Um, it's, what I've, it's what I've done, it's, it's my work. Um, I'm proud of my work. I know it's just my first semester in college, but um, it's a tough time, and I'm, I'm glad I've got it done, and I'm glad I'm able to share it with you. Um, I think there's a lot to say about you as a teacher, um, just being able to teach, you know, 50-plus students at once is really impressive, and um, I admire um, your kind of consistent determination to receive feedback and make your course better. Um, and I think I utilized that, and I noticed you making changes to the courses um, when issues were voiced. Um, so yeah, just thank you for teaching everybody this semester. Um, thank you for all your outside work that you did. Um, you know, talking to the senators or whatever you did that day, it's really impressive. Um, yeah, be well. Happy holidays.